We appreciate every one of our PAA members, because together you make events like this one possible. So if you aren't a member, or if you've lapsed, please talk to Danielle out front about renewing. This evening we're going to be celebrating 125 years of innovation at the UW School of Pharmacy and highlight the women among us who teach, research, practice, and mentor within the pharmacy community. Tonight we're going to hear personal stories from our panelists about their journeys and their pharmacy careers. We may also ask you to share your stories with those seated at your tables. To get us started, here's a little bit of my story. Like many of us in this room, I didn't come to pharmacy on my own. I was intro introduced to it by a mentor. I also happen to be related to that mentor. My mom worked as a state in the state psych hospital as a pharmacist for about 25 years. And on certain weekends when I was younger, she would take me with her to the pharmacy. And while she was typing out labels and hand mixing TPNs, I'd wander up and down the aisles of meds, uh, looking through, rifling through the carts that were going to be filled at the start of the next week uh, for ward rounds. My mom used to tell me that she went into pharmacy because it allowed her to be several things at once. She could be a healthcare provider, and a pretty damn good one if I can say that. She could have a family, and she could be engaged in her community. I always got a kick out of calling her at work when I was a little bit older, because for the briefest of moments when she answered the phone, I got to hear from business Pam instead of just mom. A, a career in pharmacy allowed her to be all of these parts of herself. So we'll hear from our panelists in just a few minutes about how they were mentored into and through their careers, as well as the many roles they have played, including that of innovator. Lastly, we have a few logistical pieces for this evening. As part of our pharmacy community, we ask that you would join in tonight's discussion using the Poll Everywhere app or by texting the word Catterman to number 22333. Please feel free to chime in during the presentation and submit your questions to the panelists after the formal presentation. If you follow the prompts on the screen and detailed app and text information is provided at your tables. We hope that you enjoy our little experiment this year with the family style table seating uh, and enjoy the refreshments. Please feel free to get up throughout the event to get more drinks, uh, more snacks. Try to be a little casual this year. I want to ask you to join me in welcoming Dean Sean Sullivan to the podium. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for being here. Lovely evening on the Seattle campus. And I want to welcome you all to the PAA, the Pharmacy Alumni Association, and the School of Pharmacy's annual Don Cattleman Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm pleased to see, walking around the room here, that uh, much of our community is well represented in the audience this evening. And as you all look around, you'll see you're joined by fellow alums, and faculty, friends, family members. There's even some students here, including a few of the newly admitted students will be starting in the fall of 2020. They will be the, yeah. So it, 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 I mean, I'm thinking to myself, if I don't feel old enough, we all don't feel old enough, that would be the class that graduates in 2024. Amazing. Uh, those of you who've been to this lecture before and some of our other events, you know how much I like to talk about our amazing students. So I'm going to, as I always do at this particular time, let you know one little fact about our students. Um, so when you finish the PharmD program, um, to get licensed in the state of Washington, you have to take the NAPLEX exam and the law exam, two separate exams. And the licensure exam is particularly tough. And so I want to read for you pass rates from our students for the last five years. By the way, just in case there's uh, any worry about this, graduates from the University of Washington finished at the very top of the country each of the last five years. So let me just read these to you. It might sound a little repetitive, I'm sorry. 2015, 99%, 2016, 99%, 2017, 98%, oops. 2018, 98%, 2019, 100%. That's a testament uh, to the quality of the students who apply to the University of Washington School of Pharmacy and the ones we accept, obviously. And many students actually choose to come here because of those pass rates. 
It's also a testament to the faculty and the staff at the school, many of whom have been uh, on faculty and as part of our community for an awfully long time. So uh, I'm really pleased to be representing them here to introduce uh, tonight's event. Um, this particular event tonight um, is special because it commemorates 125 years of women in pharmacy. And as you'll hear from Dana in a few minutes when I introduce her, we've had women in our classes since the very beginning. I would be sorely remiss if I did not take a moment to recognize a very special person who's with us tonight, who's contributed to our school's history of innovation and leadership for over 60 years. 60 years. That's Professor Emeritus Joy Plyne. faculty as a lecturer in 1966. By the way, I saw her in the office yesterday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She was in there and she said to me, proudly, I got a new computer. <laughs> I hope I can figure out how to make it work. <laughs> right, Joy? Right. She joined the faculty as a lecturer in 1966 and she was the only woman on the faculty at the time. She remained the sole faculty, female faculty member for over a decade, till the early 1980s. Her pioneering research in geriatrics and her spirit of dedication to the profession and to the many women that she has trained over the years is truly unparalleled. And tonight, we honor the achievements of those who continue to evolve and enrich the legacy created by Joy and so many others. So let's start the evening. Please join me in welcoming one of these innovators and our moderator and three-time Husky, Dr. Dana Hurley. Thank you. So 125 years ago, the School of Pharmacy was founded. Again, 1894, long time ago. It was the third school at the University of Washington, behind Arts and Sciences and the Education Department, but before medicine. <laughs> to give you some perspective of that time, that was the same era that the first football game was played. It also was the same era that germs were just coming around to being described as real and contagious. In fact, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr., who was the father of the Supreme Court Justice, first promoted the hand-washing practice. However, this did not go down so well. Much to the dismay, Charles Meggs, who famously fired back that washing hands was completely unnecessary because physicians were gentlemen. And of course, gentlemen's hands are always clean. <laughs> Obviously, we've come a long way. We have some great infectious disease people today. At the same time, the UW was making advancements of its own. The School of Pharmacy, had its first graduating class. In that class were 11 people. And in that 11 people, three of them were women. That's small by today's standards, where the majority are women. And I'm sure many of you remember looking back on posters and photographs of that time. They were all male pharmacists, gorgeous men, big old smiles, lab coats, mortar and pestle, making their, their medications. Of course, probably smiling because they're in one of the best professions at the time. But those three women in that first class, that was pretty extraordinary, pretty unique. And I think might have been the catalyst for the future. Women have thrived in pharmacy for a long time. There's a lot of flexibility in pharmacy. Pharmacy has been for providing women with the ability to manage home, manage life, their interests. And even today, there's many women and men that take advantage of that. I don't know of a, actually, I don't, I'd love if somebody else knows. <laughs> I don't know of another single career that is as high paying, well educated, that has so many options where we can have that type of flexibility. 
I mean, myself, I started out in retail pharmacy, worked in hospital pharmacy, worked in managed care, biotech, and now I have a consulting business. I mean, we have so many options available to us. So to celebrate this 125th anniversary, we have our special caterpillars here. So we're honoring those women from that first class who served as an inspiration for so many women that came after them. So as introduced, I'm Dana Hurley. I have a pharmacy degree from here as well as uh, health outcomes and economics. So today we get the fortune to hear from three women who I am personally so inspired by. You know who you are. Um, Beverly, Deb, and Vadana all have careers that have been probably met with a lot of challenges throughout their career, but also a whole lot of reward. So they expanded that pharmacist, we do good to everybody and everything mentality into a bit of uncharted territory, into some unique professions. So we get to hear from them how they discovered their passion, developed the necessary skills to excel in their field, and how they disseminate their skills and their knowledge to our community. So I'd like to welcome to the stage you extraordinary women who work tirelessly in our community for all of our benefit and the world's. So come on, come on up. So we're going to moderate. like such a big deal to the women in the class, but the next highest uh, college of pharmacies was 21% that year. So we were a long ways away uh, of anybody else as far as graduating women. Um, I've got the shortest resume of anybody in this room. I've only ever had one job. Uh, I've worked at Catterman's <laughs> Pharmacy for 50 years, and um, I, I was hired as the first delivery girl Prior to that, they'd all been delivery boys, and it was because I could drive a stick shift. <laughs> <laughs> and worked my way to intern, and then Don Catterman was ready to hire a pharmacist about the same time I graduated, so he hired me as a pharmacist. I worked as a pharmacist, and uh, I was just back from my second maternity leave when um, Mr. Catterman was working all day. He had a bad headache, went home, had a cerebral, cerebral hemorrhage, and died at age 54. Oh my gosh, what do we do now? You know, we, my partner, Steve Cohn. Steve, would you please raise your hand and let people see you. <laughs> my partner, Steve Cohn, arrived at Catterman's the same way I did. He was a delivery boy and um, did his internship there, and he had been hired to cover my maternity leave. So as luck would have it, we had plenty of help on hand, and, and Mrs. Catterman decided to keep the store, so we managed the store for Mrs. Catterman for the next 14 years, and we bought it in 1996, and in 1996, we changed the paradigm of the practice of pharmacy by offering flu shots to the community. And if this isn't a game changer, it's pretty remarkable that our little pharmacy on the corner of San Point Way changed the entire profession in that decision process. And people would sit in the flu booth and they'd look around, we only had two chairs and blank walls, and they'd go, what else do you do back here? <laughs> I don't know, maybe we should think about it. And so we began doing bone density screenings, we did cholesterol measurements, we did hemoglobin A1C. But once you get out of the box of filling prescriptions, it's pretty amazing what's out there. So we proceeded to you know, do all sorts of innovative things. In 2012, I wrote a series of protocols that gives me prescriptive authority for 30 drugs, and we have the ability to treat acute minor ailments. And, and now I run a robust travel clinic as a result of that prescriptive authority. I think people are looking for ways to stay healthy, and I've developed a health corner 
and I'm about to begin medical billing for consulting people about long-term health goals. What people need now is somebody to help them stay healthy. They don't actually need more information. It's information on the way. They need people to help them sort. So, stay tuned. <laughs> a little different story than this one, but uh, so I entered the UW, actually that time was a third generation uh, University of Washington student with my grandma and my mom before me, but I uh, entered as a computer science major because that's what the standardized test that you took in high school told me how to do, wow. um, but yeah, eventually if I, think about the career, <laughs> the trajectory then, Microsoft just getting off the ground, but I don't think about those things. <laughs> And then went on to get a master's in public health at a pharmacy residency at Virginia Mason um, with a great preceptor, Steve Hall. And then uh, from there, spent about 12 years doing a whole lot of different things in pharmacy. Yeah. <laughs> um, did, did, was a pharmacist at Harborview for a while, uh, worked with Cindy Brennan, who was a fantastic woman leader uh, for me. And then went to managed care and did some time in pharma at Park Davis and Johnson & Johnson. And then uh, one fateful day, uh, I was in a pharmacy and therapeutics committee meeting with Sean Sullivan, who said, hey, have you ever thought about a PhD? <laughs> You're uh, reviewing these economic evaluations. We've got this great program called PORP, uh, now Choice, and you might want to consider it. And I hadn't really thought about it. So I've been out of school for 12 years and um, raising a kid and thinking, wow. Um, so I did. And then went on from there to take a job in kind of a dream job for me. Um, I did that before I finished my PhD. Um, but I managed to finish it. Um, I, uh, I think Sean told me I had about a 10% chance of doing it, and I better be that 10% um, that finishes. But I uh, took a dream job at Path and was a health economist there for uh, a while, then led the health economics program, and then about five years took on the role that I have now, which is leading a group of about 50 fantastic scientists and uh, vaccine and communication specialists. And we develop and introduce vaccines into low and middle income countries. So, Follow, and I'm really honored to be here today. Uh, I actually grew up in Canada, in Prince George, British Columbia. First of all, I just want to say to everyone, thank you for getting me out of Olympia. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, I'll begin to say that, that my role right now is I'm a state representative in the, in the legislature, so it's a very different um, place, I think, and I think there should actually be many more pharmacists there. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I began um, my life in Canada, in Prince George, British Columbia, as the daughter, the eldest daughter of three girls, of um, a country doctor. And he wanted to practice in rural Canada, and he was quite um, wonderful to his patients. Um, 50 years, and many generations, and I still get more small thinking of that. But he inspired me, and one day he said he wanted all three of his girls to work, to have a profession. He says, because, you know, you, you have your mind, and it, it's something you own. And if something happens to you in your life with your, with your spouse or in any other way, you can actually go and make a living on your own and be on your own two feet. And this is an Indian man from India who wanted us three girls to have that type of independence. And across the street from where we lived was Mrs. Bixby. And Mrs. Bixby was a pharmacist. And she, was an, um, she ran the pharmacy. My dad knew her well because his patients would get medicines there. And she, they would get counseling from her. And he was really always impressed with Mrs. Bixby. And her, she had a family and she had a life. And he thought that would be a really great profession. And he suggested it to me. 
And I, being the absolutely rebellious kid, said, no, <laughs> I am, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be a researcher in neurobiology. <laughs> and uh, I had no idea what I was really talking about, but I wanted to do it. And he said, well, okay, how about this? How about you just go get, it, you know, get into pharmacy school, and then if you can always go and become a doctor or a scientist if you would like to do that. So um, I did, and, um, and I guess the rest is history. But I'm really grateful for that because everything I've learned in pharmacy has um, actually been important in my life in every single role that I've played. So then another, we all come to forks in the road and then the decision that you make takes you one way or another. And one of the decisions I made was to marry Dr. Greg Slatter. And I met him on a pharmacy ski trip in Canada. There's a whole story, we won't go into that right now there, but we got married while I was in my hospital residency, just completed my hospital residency, and as it turns out, he had a fellowship. So I, had a, a, I got my degree at UBC in pharmacy, and I did a hospital residency in um, Royal Inland Hospital in Kamloops, which is um, affiliated with UBC. And uh, he got a postdoc fellowship with none other than Dr. Tom Bailey here at the University of Washington. And in, at that time in Canada, there were no PharmD, there were no doctor pharmacy program. People would go to South Carolina, they would go to Philadelphia or somewhere like that. And the University of Washington had just started uh, their residency program, but also something called a PharmD only. It was a PharmD program with residency or one without. And since I'd already completed a residency, I had applied for the PharmD only. And uh, we came down in a U-Haul, we didn't even have a car. And uh, we had a place on Sand Point Way, and Greg did his postdoc, and I started at the University of Washington. And it was really funny because John Horn, Dr. Horn at the time, could not figure out how the Canadian grading system worked. So they were trying to decide if they were going to let me enter the program and if I would qualify, like if I had the grades. And they were sort of saying, well, how does that work? Is the, are you in the top 10% of your class? Or Because they graded really hard in, in Canada. If you had 80%, that was like, you know, no one gets 80%. So they were trying to look at these grades, and I had like 78. And they were trying to figure out, well, um, yeah, so anyway, Wayne Cragen gave me a chance, and that was wonderful. And in my class, um, I had Dr. Peggy Odegaard, and I think Dr. Nancy Driesner is also here somewhere, and I didn't get a chance to give her a hug. But um, So we had seven members in our class, and three, um, four were women, I believe. So Deb and, De and Nancy, Peggy and me. And uh, the three farm the only there's Dion as well. So um, it was an incredible program. And afterwards, Greg got a position uh, with the Epson Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I just want you to hear that in Kalamazoo, Michigan. <laughs> and I had been trained at Harvard View and University of Washington Medical Center at the height of the HIV um, epidemic. So I was trained in infectious disease. It was an interest of mine by the best in the world. And we had maybe 10 patients on general medicine at Harvard with HIV. Anyway, those are all stories I can get into more. But um, I, I, we went to a small town in Michigan, and I went to work in the hospital there in Battle Creek Health Systems, and Greg worked at the Upjohn Company. And subsequently, I also joined the Upjohn Company, Medical Drug Information, and went to the dark side. And I was told that that is exactly what I did, was going to the dark side. And um, so um, I, I will tell you why um, later on when we're talking why I'm in politics and why I'm so motivated by public service in a moment. But I, um, I, I was so frustrated because I didn't know what my path would be in industry because people did not have that experience and it was not necessarily an exciting one. I still remember going to ACCP and um, Students would come to me under the cover of darkness with sunglasses on to find out how to go to industry and how to get into industry. Because I had started a PRN at ACCP, Practice Research Network. And I remember the head of ACCP was not very happy about it because um, he wanted people to go into the practice of pharmacy and you know, not necessarily the dark side. And so we had to go through a lot of hoops to have our PRN. And just one quick story about that is that uh, most of the uh, companies would give um, would give uh, sponsor P 
care in for cardiology or for you know renal disease or for whatever it was, neurology. The PRN for industry had no sponsors. <laughs> we were like the poorest PRN because we were actually industrial pharmacists. Um, so uh, after that, uh, we went to New Jersey for a little while, after about 10 years at, at the Upjohn Company, and then eventually moved back to the West Coast. And Greg had a position with Merck Biotech in um, genetics and doing research. And I um, actually went back to the University of Washington to do my Master's of Public Administration. Because one thing I learned was that in the developing world, we needed more medicines and we just didn't have the infrastructure there. And so I was pretty inspired by Pat at the time and got my MPA degree. And eventually, for, um, I can talk a little bit more in detail when you have questions, but I'll wrap up quickly just to say that I was on the Board of Pharmacy um, and learned the intersection between uh, government and policy and science and pharmacy. And that was kind of what spurred my interest in, in politics. So um, I became Bellevue City Council member and ultimately a state representative after also working in industry. So I'm sorry, I feel old. So clearly, extraordinary women. I think we can all agree. <laughs> develop and disseminate and I'd really like to hear more of your explanation especially if I was like how did you discover not just being a pharmacist that that almost seems like the easy step in your career <laughs> but how did you discover the new things that you wanted to do in pharmacy were there people that inspired you was it all just up here your heart like, what was it so I have had fabulous mentors in my career and that would be my one piece of advice to anyone is seek out people that you admire or seek out people that are creative thinkers that you want to participate in the conversation. They're not gonna find you. You're gonna have to make some effort to go out and do it, but I've had fabulous mentors. Don Catterman was passionate about pharmacy. And as a student and a young pharmacist, he made me do things that I didn't actually feel comfortable doing. You know, I had to call up my state representative. I went downtown to his office. I'm trembling. And, and he made me be active in the state of organizations. And so he, he did things that took me out of my comfort zone, but that then acquainted me with other people that were doing some pretty exciting and interesting things. Um, Joy Klein is my all-time favorite mentor. <laughs> time favorite mentor and so there have been very strong active women after Don Catterman died Beverly Catterman ran Catterman's pharmacy for 14 years on her own and I learned a lot from that lady she wasn't even a pharmacist but she had a passion for pharmacy and that's something that sort of comes from within and it's kind of contagious when you're around passionate people you develop a passion and so I'm a people person. I could talk for another nine hours right here right now. I'll be quiet. Do you bring your pajamas? <laughs> and, but, but being a people person, you know, you talk to people. You find out what their needs are, what their expectations are, what their disappointments are, what they would like to see done differently. And so that's what we've always guided our practice at Catamans is by focusing on what's in the best interest of the patient. And sometimes it's something that we don't know how to do or we're not doing right now, but maybe we could do that. And so when you print your own business card, you get to put whatever you want on your own business card. So to, my first business card said pharmacist, and my second business card said certified vaccine specialist, and my next business card said clinical community pharmacist. My next one said clinical, no, my next one said health advisor, and my next one is going to say health strategist. That's what's the okay, is to figure out how to stay healthy. And that's what I think pharmacy's coming role is, is to figure out how to how to help people make healthy decisions. That's great. And Deb, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a very, very long time. Good friends. I have no idea how you got started at PATH. I don't, you know, what was it that motivated you to go that direction? Um, you know, it wasn't the obvious choice at the time. Yeah. Uh, no, it's a really good question. 
I think what I was going to say in the intro, though, that I think is really important for me sitting here in this audience is that I realize that I'm really just here on behalf of uh, like thousands and thousands and thousands of women who are making strides in the pharmacy field or making strides with their pharmacy background in other fields. And so just want to say I'm really honored to be here on behalf of them, too. So, um, but if it helps just to tell a few stories about um, some of us, I think uh, that's great. For me, uh, well, I first have to tell you about a dream killer, because I think dream killers can be very good in your life, right? So we have mentors, we have influencers, not the social media kind, but, you know, and then um, we have these effective dream killers. And so one of the things, I thought I wanted to be an architect from the time I was 10, because my grandma went on this trip, and she was uh, to Chicago, and she, the central part of, like, one of the tallest buildings in the world. So I started asking questions about how it would be built, and, and they said, well, you need an architect, and I thought, that is it. <laughs> that is what I want to do. I want to be responsible for one of the buildings. But I had, in ninth grade, I took a drafting class, and Mr. Jacobs was a drafting teacher, because this is really what I wanted to do. And um, pretty soon it became very clear, and he told me that um, you have really no spatial ability. <laughs> No honesty. <laughs> and, and I, but I mean, I, I got a decent grade under the class because I worked hard. But if you hadn't said that, I, I, I wouldn't have known. I would have found it later. So I, I think there's, for me, as I look back, it's almost times that happened where either somebody said, hey, you're not suited for that, or gosh, you have some dreams, but maybe you ought to think about it a little bit differently because I know a little bit more than you do. So, um, but in terms of uh, global health, probably a, a lot. Uh, and I think it, it may have started, well, I just have to uh, make a shout out to Jackie Gardner because Jackie had had some experience with the path with Plan B, right? And um, they did a lot of pharmacy school, had a good relationship with PATH. And when I was, I think early in my PhD program, really, I went to her and she, we just in the process of a couple of conversations, we had some pretty pivotal conversations about PATH. She introduced me to somebody who was an alum who was at World Health Organization, another place I've kind of fantasized about, I thought that was the greatest thing. I went and visited him. Um, and so just those key conversations, when you put it out there, what you're interested in and what you want to do, then people know what they can talk to you about too. So I also just put it out there a lot. I'm really interested in this, this is what I want to do. Um, but it was really, I think, even pharmacy school, I'd say that I knew that I loved pharmacy, but I knew I'd probably do something so that's why I went on to get my MPH and then started having discussions about um, public health. But last but not least, I'll say I had another dream killer conversation with a professor emeritus called Oscar Gish, who was um, in school public health. And again, I thought my dream would be to finish my MPH and go to WHO or UNICEF. I mean, I was going to run UNICEF one day after all, that's, you know, where I was going. And and he had, he invited me uh, with his wife to tea at his house. And I didn't know him very well. I think he lectured in a class. He wasn't even one of my new professors. And he actually sat me down and, and said, here's the deal with WHO. You need to go, you need to go get a career. You need to go develop yourself to an extent that you bring a lot to the table um, at WHO. If you go in there now, that you'll get eaten alive and, and put up. And he was 100% right. I mean, I walked away with my head down and he was 100% right. And so, for me, it's, it's to put that perspective on mentors. Mentors can obviously be the wind beneath your wings and say all good things about how great you are, but there are also people who speak truth even if you don't want to hear it. Hearing a lot about mentors, and I've seen a couple up there. Who has had a mentor in their life? Yeah. All the students? If you haven't yet, you will. So, Bond and that you also clearly went a different pathway um, into, into your career. What was the motivation behind that? You, had, you talked a little bit about joining the Board of Pharmacy. Um, was that the, the pivotal point for you? Or was there a mentor or somebody that pushed you in that direction? Um, it's so funny because when I get asked that question, I go back a little bit further when I was at the Exxon Company. And you're just talking about mentors, about people who make you think differently about you, your work, and how you can approach it. And then something happens and you make a decision and, and that, that spurs you to do something else. And 
I love your idea and, and your comment about how people might actually kind of give you a kick in the butt a little bit. And um, when I was working at the Upjohn Company, um, I was working with a colleague of mine who um, was in medical and drug information. He did the site on medicine, I did cancer and infectious disease. And he's really smart. And he started before I did. Um, and we, um, my son was born in 96. And uh, I decided I was going to take family leave. And at the time, it was about three years after President Clinton had passed the FMLA. And you could actually take unpaid leave if you, you know, 21 weeks unpaid additional. And you would get your job back. And that was a big deal. And so uh, Greg and I decided this is our first born. We're in a completely new city. We don't have a lot of family support. And we really wanted to give him a strong start to life. And so we did. We set some money aside. And we took the 21 weeks. And um, when I went back to work, I went to a different role, and it was a role in clinical research and, and, and um, clinical research operations. And uh, it was a great job, and I also had the opportunity. Um, you know the package inserts that companies have for medicine? I, I thought they were very poorly done, and I thought they really needed to be a little bit more relevant and work with the standard of care, but also be accurate scientifically. And so I was also on a team to help redesign those. And um, I asked that, um, and Frank had already been, you know, looking at, at his role and trying to figure out if he wanted to move on. So I said, if you're looking for another person on this team, this is the guy. He's really smart. He knows his stuff. So he came and joined the team, and I got a raise, I was to fifty thousand, and I got a raise to fifty-five thousand. And um, this was very exciting for me. At any rate, um, um, one day he came into my office and he said, um, "How much do you make?" And I said, well, I don't really you know, share that information usually, but I make in the range of 50, you know. And he said, Vandana, he said, I make $75,000. And I started six months before you. And he said, I think you need to have an, a, a salary evaluation. And it was a, a good friend who shared that with me. And I did. I got a salary evaluation. But it woke me up to the fact that um, I had not had a child before that. I was married to someone who was working, and Frank had three kids, and he was, you know, every time he needed to get a minivan or do something else, the boss would increase his salary um, over and above that of other people, and I suspect even as a woman. And uh, so uh, that woke me up to what, uh, you know, what am I worth? You know, what, how do I, how do I proceed? And so I, I applied for a different position, and I got a, a raise, and I knew I started to learn how to advocate for myself. And those positions gave me the opportunity to move into leadership and strategy within the organization, and also to be a voice. And one thing I've learned um, is that amplifying women's voices in the same rooms that you are in are things that we really need to do. But to get into your question about politics, um, that, that job, I, I was able to do the clinical trials, write the clinical trials, and help the operations for those trials for the um, drug linezolin, which is for gram-positive infections, as many of you probably know. And um, 20 years later, my father, who was dying of cancer, um, had some infection. And uh, I sat by his bedside, and I looked up at that bag, and it was linezolin. And it extended his life. There we go again, but yeah. And so I just want you to know that the impact that we make in our lives and the people that can come into our lives to question us is, is, is really quite valuable. But that's one of the reasons why I'm in office and why I run for office, because I think that government should be smart and effective. It should remove obstacles for people's lives. It should be data-driven, evidence-based. There should be analytics. There should be scientists. We should understand responsible innovation and regulation. But because of that story, and that, I think that kind of was a thread in my life, and, and that's a problem. Yeah, there it is. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I can't see you back there with the lights, but um, I think we'll move on to the next topic. Um, you guys just laugh up there if somebody posts something really funny and you want to read it out loud, um, or something very insightful. Um, so, Deb. Um, You've gone through several different careers at PATH, always growing in responsibility. How do you develop those skills? Are you 
taking, are you doing education? Are you learning just by fire? Um, how do you develop those um, to, to do what you do? So I can start at the very beginning of uh, my time of path. So I walked in and the first assignment really that I had was to develop a demand forecast for rotavirus vaccines for the globe, for the world. So, I mean, minus the OECD countries, but the entire, all the low and middle income countries. Uh, yeah, I've been at Johnson & Johnson, and I knew that they had demand, but they had a forecast demand, and um, that they had a lot of market data and that kind of thing, so I thought, this can't be that hard. Um, big mistake. Um, and in this world, we didn't have a lot of data. You don't have people going out doing market data in Namibia or in Cambodia or whatever. I mean, wow. So, it, like I, yeah, it was, that's the stunning first assignment. I thought, all right, I'm not going to be here very long. <laughs> um, but I did, so what I did is I just started, well, first of all, I started reading, you know, like what you're talking about, go to the literature, see what's out there. And literally the best and most relevant studies that I could find were on forecasting demand for train schedules in Europe. <laughs> like literally, like some of the methods and science behind, you know, how do we make sure that these trains get here on time? I've never read that literature before, it was kind of interesting. But just look at methodology and that kind of thing. And so, um, so that was hard. But then secondly, I started just reaching out to people um, who in the field. And I was really fortunate enough to find a woman who it was doing basically the same assignment I did, essentially, for uh, pneumococcal vaccines for low and middle income. And she'd been uh, at this for about a year uh, before I came on. And so we just, she was based at uh, Johns Hopkins, I was here in Seattle, but we just made a plan. And she shared everything she knew with me. And I thought, wow, this is weird, just coming from a very rigid uh, confidentiality-based system at, say, uh, Pharma, to a public health environment where you can share everything and anything, and that was also hard to get used to, but basically she just she just said, hey, let's do this together, and we did it. And, you know, it was novel, nobody had ever done a global demand forecast for these vaccines. Um, it, you know, it ended up, uh, you know, now we have data to figure out if we were right or wrong, and we weren't far off. Um, we really thought that the African countries would come on sooner, but it was really Latin America who got in there and started. So we were wrong a little bit about countries, which were the first countries, but in terms of actual total demand of doses, it, it wasn't far off. But yeah, so for me, I, I do look back and think, um, probably sometimes to my detriment, I don't think about all the problems ahead of time, I just start stepping in. Um, I guess being raised by a mom who always thought about those things for me, um, I just never really had to, and so just headlong into um, new areas, and yeah, incredibly curious and often interested in way too many things, um, but it, it paid off in many ways, just to go and do it. So, just one end that I can probably share, but I'll have to interview you again. <laughs> Bond and I, um, being at, in Olympia, you have access probably to a lot of people, maybe with ulterior motives <laughs> at times, but um, very genuine people as well. Um, how do you utilize those people that you have access to to help you get through and understand some of the bills that are coming across your desk? So um, I sit um, in the Democratic Caucus, which is 57 members and there's 41 Republicans, so we hold the majority in the House. And I always like to call it um, the team as Seahawks, and that we all have a role to play uh, in, on that team. Uh, and uh, if, I don't think I would be, and it's actually a pretty amazing team. These are people who come from many different walks of life, and they have a lot of knowledge and background. But I have to say, if I link it to pharmacy, I have to say that all of the tools that I learned as a pharmacist in my, um, in my studies, in my work life, in my research, all of those tools are incredibly important because we learn how to work on teams, we learn how to speak truth to sometimes kind of scary people, um, like the cardiologist, the very first cardiologist I had to tell 
um, if you change a dose. Um, we, learn, um, we learn how to use evidence and data. Everyone's laughing because they know they have the one, right? The first one. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we, we learn a lot of those tools. And because of those tools, I feel like I've been um, effective in many different roles in my life. And so I have to say those threads have been woven into the fabric of all the work that I do. And remember that those are skills that you will carry with you no matter what. So, so in the caucus, we have a team of um, people that, so if somebody is a very good expert in criminal justice and has a really big heart for it, then we listen to what they have to say and make a decision about whether we would support a bill. When it comes to science, um, people like to listen to me, and which is really great because I think that we definitely need people in science in this field. And, um, and I like to ask a lot of questions. Um, I'm known as the person who asks a lot of questions <laughs> um, when I sit on committee. Uh, because I think that that is incredibly important, not only to deliver the outcome that you're looking for and understanding, but it also builds transparency of knowledge. And one of the things I'm learning is that in, civic, in the civic world, people really don't know what's going on in Olympia. They don't know really how government works. You don't really know how bills become laws. And if you don't know that, then you're not able to weigh in when it's really meaningful to you and important to you. And so, um, so I, I, think, I think those types of tools have been really helpful to me. And it's funny because I've worked in industry as well with really high performing teams. And uh, it's not a typical behavior for people necessarily. Um, they they want to be expert in their own space. You have to learn to work on your committee and organize yourself. And I think women in particular are pretty good at being able to facilitate conversations, navigate emotions, determine how to partner, and then come out with a with, with a solution. I sit on one committee where the chair is um, the chair is a, a man, and everyone else is a woman, and we are always so um, supportive, and we. It's just been an incredible committee to work on because nobody worries about ownership. We just take on the problem and we solve it. And frankly, I think that's what pharmacists do too. I think that we are quiet but effective problem solvers. And that has been an incredibly helpful tool for me. It comes naturally because of how we've been trained. But honestly, people say, how did you do that? How did you get to that solution? And I'm thinking, Every single pharmacist I know would have no problem getting gotten to that solution. But it's not like typical, you know, for most people to be. We're talking about ulterior motives, um, honestly, I think data and science and truth matters, right? So, so people can't really pull anything over on you when you're actually, when you have good data. But I have the same problem in government and politics that the data are not necessarily that firm are well known and the modeling is somewhat primitive. So um, pushing on, on, we have great OPR staff, but there are a lot of lawyers that work. So let me give you an example. In the healthcare committee, um, we would have a drug transparency bill, for example, for pricing. They did not know, the senior healthcare um, advisor who's really smart and understands all of the different um, complexity of insurance and modeling, she did not know the difference between a generic and a brand drug, drug company. She did not know the difference of an innovator doing R&D versus a generic company. And I, I, I was like blown away because I asked the question, are we talking about generics in this situation or what? And they would look at me blankly. And so it was just so, um, I was so shocked that something as simple as that, that we just know and take for granted, that people did not know. And that happens all the time, time and time again. And so um, I really feel like we need more pharmacists and more scientists and people in, in government to help to get the solution. Is there anybody in the audience that has given politics a thought? Oh, nice. All right, you guys hook up. <laughs> So we've talked a lot about what has been inward focusing as far as like you know mentors that have have taught you, have given you your passion, have poked you and prodded you and given you the skills you need. How do you give that back? How do you disseminate that knowledge that you have, um, that wisdom, ideas, and thoughts? Because clearly you guys have accomplished a lot. 
So what are some, some pearls of wisdom you can share with others about how you do that? Uh-huh. Well, I think encouraging younger uh, employees and younger pharmacists to be active in uh, their professional organizations, to be active in um, alumni events at their college of pharmacy. I think staying connected is important. And sometimes as you start out your career and you're raising a family and that kind of thing, it's not the right time to do that. But that's the other thing that I've discovered along the way is that you don't have to be all things to all people at the same time. There are phases to your pharmacy career. But to encourage young pharmacists at least to be active in one or two professional organizations and to be active with your peer group if they can. And I, I find that to be very, very valuable. And, and sometimes it's, uh, you know, getting in your way. Sometimes it's, you know, giving them air miles to make the trip or whatever. But there's lots of ways that you can encourage them to be active in ways that they might not be. It's a really important point because when you're early in your career, you don't necessarily have that self-esteem and don't feel like you can do a lot of things that you actually are very capable of doing. So having a mentor like yourself influencing that, I think it's greatly beneficial. How about you, Dan? Yeah, well, I think somehow, magically, I decided at 45, which was a little while ago, um, that I actually had something to share. You know, I mean, I think for a long time, you, you just feel like you're, you're living your own life, you do, you have a lot of things that you're juggling, uh, and also you're still, I felt like still very much in, in learning mode, and I don't know why, I don't know why that was, I tell people now, I don't know why it's 45, but you know, they, you have something to get back, and maybe it's because you start looking old, so people are coming to you. <laughs> so, that could be it, but, um, but I, I, so honestly, I, when I was younger, I don't feel like I was as involved in some of those, um, those spaces uh, that I felt, gosh, I should be, I should be in more, you know, the society meetings and that kind of thing. But, but I think since then, really trying to take more of a concerted effort, and in some traditional and non-traditional ways, traditionally it's like making sure that, you know, when you're giving presentations at conferences, that you know who your audience is, and that you're trying to relay and speak to them. Um, I teach some vaccinology courses for young professionals that are in, um, in the vaccine space or in the uh, pharmaceutical space which is really rewarding because then you can keep in touch with them and see how they're doing. But also, I think that the other thing is that there's this title of mentor, and I used to think of it so formally, like you have to have a title of mentor, you have to be somebody's boss, you have to be some senior, you know, a parent or a, a big sister brother. And what I realized in looking back at my mentors, um, I actually had people who were influencers of mine that weren't necessarily in formal roles or positions, but what distinguished all of them, from mentor to the influencer, was they actually took the time, you know, to just have a conversation with you, to listen to you, um, you know, to have, yeah, to just, it was right place, right time, had a meaningful conversation. And so what I've tried to do is take that in, in my own career now and be open and be transparent and let people know that they can come and talk to me. And then now what I've started doing is having just one-on-ones with some of the younger staff in our organization. Just have coffee, you know, and not pretend like, oh yeah, you really need to hear from me, but just tell me how things are going. And 99% of the time, things come up, you know, where you feel like, yeah, I've done a few things, I've done a lot of things wrong, so I might as well tell somebody so they don't do it. <laughs> else. But yeah, so that's that's really been traditional and non traditional. I'm just gonna jump in totally off somewhat off topic here. Um, I chair the recognition committee for the foundation board and what you guys are bringing up is something we talk about all the time and that's giving back and connecting with students. It is, they want it, they want it so much. And having that opportunity to be able to do that is fantastic and I think the School of Pharmacy has a really good system for that because we have internships, we have our rotations and that type of thing, but those are kind of your bosses at the moment. So I would encourage any of you, if you have that opportunity to connect with the School of Pharmacy and just offer to be 
a mentor or just have a single conversation one time with a student. It's incredibly powerful and they really, really do enjoy it. On to next. I think that I loved your comment about how and you've made mistakes and you might as well tell someone. I feel like that is so great because um, you know when you when you look on Facebook or you look out into the world, everybody's so perfect and has achieved so much and there's all this great stuff. And when you're a student, you think, oh my, that just seems really unattainable. Um, I often talk about the time when I lost my first election um, and how hard it was and what I gained from it, like my political MBA. And uh, so for those who are interested in running for office, you know, um, loss is not necessarily loss. Um, I also feel like you never really, it, it, we have such a, a very rigid way that we go through this degree and then this degree, and there's so many good reasons for that. But when I sit in Olympia, um, I went there thinking, okay, I'm gonna work on these issues, and then I'm gonna go to these committee meetings, and you find yourself completely overtaken with um, an issue like homeless children. And that might not have been my area or my issue. And, and there's so many, there's 3,000 bills that get introduced, we call them drop, because there's a wooden box that you have to drop them in. Just, yeah, anyway. Um, and so it's like called the hopper, and you drop your bill into this box. And anyway, there's 3,000 bills, and that comes from all sides, the Senate and the House. And then it can go through 22, maybe, overall committees. And those, then they get called down, the committee doesn't pass some and passes some, and eventually they get to the floor of the House, and we pass around 400 bills. Can you imagine trying to keep track of 400 different sets of policy? It's really hard, and sometimes people want to know if you're going to champion something or co-sponsor something. So you have to almost follow your heart more than your brain. Like you look at something, and if it, if it, if it impacts you viscerally to trust that, to trust yourself, and proceed. And just start. Start with something that interests you, that is a passion for you. Um, I still remember when I would teach a farm D class, and kids, young people, I call them kids, but yeah, they would, they would ask me, you know, how do I move into industry into a field that I want to do research in, for example? And I would say, well, first of all, what is your interest? What area do you love? And maybe it would be cardiology, or in my case, it was infectious disease. You know, read about that literature, go to those meetings, find out what medicines are being developed, talk to the people, and work, you know, eventually you will find that path yourself, because you're smart, you're capable, and, and it's okay. You don't have to actually know the outcome. And you might lose, and it might go back a few steps, but it will teach you who is important and where you need to go. And so um, I use my heart quite a lot, my heart, my gut, in Olympia to make decisions about where I want to go, and then I, then I use my brain to help solve the problem. And I encourage everyone to sort of follow that initially because I think I think sometimes we're we're told we have to know the outcome and we don't. Well, thank you so much for this very all too brief question and answer. I'd really like to open it up to the audience if that's something we can do, Danielle. Yep. Um, I don't know if there's any questions people have already asked through polling. Do you guys have a microphone that you can hand around? Or is it just through polling? We have a mic. Okay. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? I have a question. Uh, Vaughn, what have you learned since you were elected about benefit managers and prescription benefit managers and the impact on pharmacy and health care quality and accessibility in general? So, um, last year or the year before, I did a bill um, uh, on the gag rule. I don't know if you're familiar with that, where pharmacists are um, not allowed necessarily to tell patients about the, 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 if, if they were to get their meds at cost, what that would be. Um, so, PBMs would, would take, uh, so there would be, a, you'd come in and you'd have to pay hundred and something dollars for your medicine, and then um, then you'd have to pay maybe a copay or something like that. And what you didn't know is that the copay would go back to the PBM as almost like a premium or a commission for them having done the work for the insurance company. And if you just paid out of pocket, it would have been maybe 20 bucks. 
and the pharmacist, um, in order to keep the contract with the insurance company or the PBM, was not allowed to tell you that cost that you could pay without having to go through the insurance. And that was called a, in, in sort of like in, in a jargon, it was just called a gag rule. So I did a bill to make that um, against the law. And uh, it actually ended up passing federally, but it didn't quite work for the state, so um, Representative Gildon, a Republican, did that this year um, to complete that. But in that process, I learned something about PBMs. And I learned that there's a little bit of history and that it's very opaque, that, there's, that they've been middle, middle managers for a very long time, and maybe when they started out, it was actually pretty reasonable to do clinical, um, sort of to be in, in the middle to have clinical um, uh, recommendations and also to negotiate with drug companies. There are so many drugs, so many drug companies, if you're an insurer, then you need this sort of middleman to help you. But in the course of time, these, these became more and more powerful and more and more relied on. And what's happened is that they are now kind of, they're now buying insurance companies, for example and uh, changing the system in such a way that we don't really even know where the costs are at any one point in the whole entire system. At one point, they gave us a flow chart of how, for example, drug prices are calculated and how we pay, and you could not follow the flow chart. I mean, I think I'm a pretty reasonably well-trained person, and it, there's just no way to actually follow these boxes, and a lot of them were dark because they, they were opaque. Okay. Like, literally and figuratively. So um, we have, a con there's a lot of concern about PBMs. They're now becoming much more, people understand what they are. They're, it's a bipartisan issue. And we're seeing um, bills and laws trying to be passed, although they have a lot of power. They show up and they throw their weight around. And, um, you know, with uh, Amazon uh, thinking to, I think it was the CBS acquisition, Anyway, with that happening, I think it's sort of disrupting a little bit the, the, the area. But until we actually are able to open the hood and see how the whole system works, um, we're not going to be able to be as effective, I think, as we, we need to be. And pharmacists, particularly independent pharmacists, are significantly impacted. So but we're not giving up. So we do have a question. Um, what advice would you give yourself on day one of pharmacy school. <laughs> Do we all remember? Don't say Marjorie E. Marjorie E. was our lab instructor and she was like dragon. <laughs> so learn the emotions of your professors I still before remember, you talk to them. I'll tell you because I, I was typing up labels, it was typing at that time, typing labels, and you weren't allowed to make any errors, of course. And so I had, I kept making a, an error or a typo, and I'd have to do the next thing, label, the next label, and so I was like kind of going through some labels. And this is Marguerite in a nutshell. She walks by and she looks at me, no emotion. Vandana. What are you writing? Gone with the wind? <laughs> <laughs> and that was one of the nice comments. So, just to say, you could get to Marguerite's class. And it wasn't until later that I learned that one of her labels had been an error and a young child had died when she was a pharmacist. And so she became a pretty strict and very precise. So yeah, day one, don't make Marguerite be mad. Just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bennett's here. She was my first pharmacy buddy. Uh, we met in uh, microbiology class pre, it was like, was a, yeah, a requirement before getting in, and so we met each other, and it was, it was good, but yeah, she was really a lot of fun. I was busy doing a lot of those things and all that kind of stuff. and. Uh, you know, kind of look back and think, gosh, yeah, I could have, you know, really like socialized more and um, and all that. So I guess I mean maybe that's not what faculty wants to hear <laughs> in a response, but but also um, yeah, I think that there's so much um, 
it almost felt like there was a little bit of living on the surface, and I think I learned so much. In, I mean, it was almost like the professors taught me in spite of myself. You know, stuff sank in in spite of you know where I where I was at the time, and I just have you know immense respect and really grateful uh, grateful for their dedication to all of us. And um, I guess it's also the other thing that. I would I tell myself advice, what advice would I give myself? It's like recognizing how much this degree, even if right now I'm not playing a traditional role, how much this degree really has been the foundation of what I've done. You know, you talk about learning about, yeah, I live in vaccine, and yes, that's a pharmacy based, you know, it's, it's medicine source, but my learning curve is so much faster than um, people, most people I work with aren't pharmacists, and so it just makes life so I think it's also just realizing that you may not end up in a traditional role, um, but if you don't, I can tell you the critical thinking, um, the way you problem solve, uh, a number of things that, that I learned are applicable. So if you're feeling like you're certain biochemistry class, or wait a second, um, well, what is pharmacology? Is that a class? I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I just some classes that may not seem applicable, um, um, they are. Even if you don't use that exact piece of information, um, really have been incredibly useful just in the way you approach things um, and what you do with both science and people. Everly, there's a great new question up here for you. What do you see as the future of pharmacy? Patient care, patient care, patient care. More hands-on patient care. And in ways that we haven't even thought of yet. But there are so many ways that we could help people improve their lives that aren't necessarily related to dispensing. And so I think that's where we need to be focusing is on improved outcomes that don't necessarily rely on drugs. I would say that I also see um, uh, Don Downing here, and I see uh, Susan Boyer here, and I just want to point out and highlight the support of pharmacy and leadership in pharmacy with doing things that are novel and, uh, and unique. And um, I think pharmacists sometimes shoot themselves in the foot a little bit and they're very quiet and like you've got the nurse practitioners out there doing all this stuff. And Don's been just a huge advocate for pharmacists sort of prescribing, for thinking outside the box. And um, I just think that, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, all the skills, all the tools, all the care, compassion, knowledge, teamwork is there. And I think that this profession can certainly lead. And um, I'm really always proud to call myself a pharmacist in the, in the house. And uh, people are um, very respectful still of this profession. So can I just add something? Absolutely. I, I go to quite a few national meetings. And I can tell you that Washington State is the enemy of just about every state in the country as far as practicing <laughs> anybody else, and we might as well just blaze a trail and show them a good example or something. <laughs> well, I think we are close to running out of time, but there was a special activity. Danielle? Do you have the question? <laughs> so, if you could answer this, if you've been using the poll now in the app or text, if you could describe in one word how you describe the community of women in pharmacy. We're going to create a word art out of this. So if you've ever seen that before, um, it basically shows how, how many people choose the same word, the same the magnitude of that, and what words other people describe. And while that's going, I would like to thank our wonderful panelists, Vandana, Deb, and Beverly. Thank you so much for your insight and for sharing your career journey, your motivations, your passions with everybody here. And thank you all so much for coming. This is an incredibly huge turnout. So thank you very much. And hopefully we can do something like this again, a little bit more specialized and um, solo event for the evening. So thank you very, very much.
Und die Leute.